So this is actually some um, long overdue work I should have done in the previous few years, but um, now because we are in the 2023 to 2027 study design period, I think it's worthwhile going back and uh, having a look at these 2019 mass method exam too. So I'll go through the multi-choice questions first. First of all, this function has um, three sine two x over five minus two. This is the equation. So the period is two pi over the n value, which is two over five. And that gives you five pi. And uh, because we have a maximal domain, all real numbers, the range, let's say it's the center line minus two subtracting three and uh, minus two, the center line plus three. So you actually get a minus five and a one. So therefore option B will be correct. Okay, now question two, the set of values of K for which X squared plus two X minus K equals to zero has two real solutions. So discriminant is two squared minus four times one times minus K. Must be, let's say, greater than zero. And um, you have four plus four K greater than zero. Therefore, four K is greater than minus four and K is greater than minus one. So I would say option B is the correct answer. Questions three and the question four, they are actually very um, straightforward questions if you use your CAS calculator correctly. For example, is f of x is a over x minus four, where a is a positive real constant. And we would like to find the average rate of change from x equals to six to x equals to eight. And um, question four, you could just use your CAS calculator to evaluate this definite integral. So what I'm going to do is um, I'll show you the CAS operations. Now, let's say I define f of x equals to a divided by x minus one. You could either go for f of eight, subtracting f of six divided by eight minus six, and that is equal to minus a over eight, which is option E. Alternatively, if you wish, you could try this command. Average rate of change, abbreviated to ABGRC, average rate change. F of x, comma, x equals to six. And uh, the last entry is going to be eight minus six, which is the interval length. And that gives you minus A over eight. And um, question four, we want to calculate an integral. So we press shift plus zero to pi over six a times sine x plus b times cosine x dx. So that is something we probably would expect. And um, now all the options would be, um, you know, one single fractions. So I would say I'll press algebra, menu three algebra, fraction two works, and uh, four, common denominator. And I try to get this um, in one line, all right? So it looks like we've got um, a times two minus root three, something like this. Let me type it out. A times two <laughs> minus square root of three plus b divided by two, okay? So that will give me, let's say, option c as the correct answer. Okay, so now let's keep going with the other multi-choice questions. Question five, let f of f dash of x equals to three x squared minus two x such that f four equals to zero. So we just need to anti-differentiate. So f of x is x to the power of three when you're anti-deriving this thing minus x squared at a c. And uh, because f four equals to zero, we have four to the power of three minus four squared at a c equals to zero. So 64 minus 16 plus c equals to zero. Therefore c is minus 48, okay? Putting this back, 
you get option C as the correct answer. Okay, so that's egg, cat, and cat. All right. Question six. We've got a rectangular sheet of cardboard. It has a length of 80 centimeters and a width of 50 centimeters. Squares of side lens X centimeters are cut from each of the corners as shown in the diagram. So this is X, this is X. This side here will be 50 minus 2X because you also cut another corner on the other side. And um, now this longer edge, once you fold it along this longer edge, it will be 80 minus 2X. And this side will also be 50 minus 2X. This side will be 80 minus 2X. So whilst you folding everything up, this will be X. This will be 50 minus 2X. This will be 80 minus 2X. So we're trying to maximize the volume with the changing variable X. Let's write the volume function X in turn, uh, V of X equals to X times 50 minus 2X times 80 minus 2X. Basically it's the length times width times the height. And then we try to maximize this volume. And um, do take note, all the physical quantities must be greater than zero. For example, X greater than zero, 50 minus 2X must be greater than zero. So eventually you get um, X between zero and 25. And we can use the Fmax command for this function over the domain zero to 25. So let's say you could have f max x times 50 minus 2x times 80 minus 2x. That is the expression for the volume. We, we are finding the maximum with respect to x from 0 to 25. When x equals to 10, that gives me the largest possible volume, which is option A. And um, if the question also wants me to find the volume itself, we could copy down the expression and a filter given that x equals to 10. And that gives me 18,000 centimeters cubed. And uh, let's move on and have a look at a question seven. Question seven and a question eight. These two questions are from the area of study discrete probability. Question seven wants you to find the mean of X with the given probability distribution. Whenever you see this phrase probability distribution, you need to recognize the sum of probabilities will be one. So you have A, 3A, 5A, and a 7A. For example, you get a 16A equals to one. And add them up. So your A value equals to one out of 16. Then what you can do is you find a mean value which is the summation of all X value times the probability of X. So zero times A plus one times three A plus two mm -hmm. times five A plus three times seven A. So you get a three A plus 10 A plus 21 A. And that will give you, for example, 34 A, okay? And you can now sub in the A value here, which is 34 times one out of 16. And that gives you 17 over eight. Okay, 17 over eight. So that is option D. And uh, we do have some cast calculator trick. So um, once I finish explaining question eight, I'll come back and explain how you could do that on the cast calculator more efficiently. Question eight, an archer has successfully hit a target with a probability of 0.9. So this is my probability of success, 0.9. The archer attempts to hit the target 80 times. So this is like number of trial A equals to 80. The outcome of each attempt is independent of an, any other attempt. So let's call this X is a binomial distribution, 80, P value is 0.9. Given that the archer successfully hits the target at least 70 times. So this is my condition. 
probability given x is greater than or equal to 70, the probability that the archer successfully hits the target exactly 74 times. So we need x equals to 74. And uh, that is a condition of probability, which is probability of x equals to 74 divided by probability of x greater than or equal to 70. And we know the upper bound is like 80. So now we need our CAS calculator to evaluate the probability required. First of all, we know the numerator is when x equals to 74 for the binomial probability, we can use menu probability distribution and we go for either binomial PDF or CDF. I'll show you the binomial CDF trick. Number of trial is 80. Probability of success is 0.9. Lower bound and upper bound. If you just need one, the probability for one particular value, you can fill in the same for lower and upper. So 74 and 74. Ignore the syntax error and then go to the bottom. Then press probability five, distribution five, and then select by norm CDF. We still have 80 and 0 0.9 as the parameters. Now we are starting from 70 because the, it says at least 70, at the most 80, because my upper bound cannot exceed the number of trial. Okay, eventually we get 0 0.1494. So option C is correct. And um, coming back to the question seven itself, if you were doing um, question seven, you probably could say, all right, you type out sum and then a curly bracket, zero comma one comma two comma three. So the, in the first curly bracket, it's a list of X values multiplied by another curly bracket, which is another list of corresponding probabilities. So you need to type in the probabilities, whatever letters or numbers in order from left to right. A comma 3A comma 5A comma 7A. So eventually you get a 34A. Now, if you just do the sum of the four probabilities, you know it's 16A. So you can solve this thing equal to one, getting A. And then subbing this a equals to one of 16 into 34a, which is the sum of all x times these probabilities, 17 over eight, okay? So that's the calculator trick I'm talking about. And we may move on to question nine. Question nine, um, here is my annotation. In 2023 to 2027, we do not have, we no longer have matrix notation for transformations. Instead, we are expected to be familiar with the T bracket X comma Y stuff, which is like, um, whenever you see these sort of notations, these X and the Y will be your original pair of coordinates. That's the old curve on the old graph or old curve. Once you slot in the X here and the Y here, the final result for each part, this is a horizontal, this is a vertical part, will be the new coordinate for the image, okay? So this is uh, quite important. Now the question actually for, is phrased as if the image of AB is zero, zero. What that means is your T of A comma B equals to half a minus half comma minus two b minus two. And the result will be zero and zero, okay? So that is uh, the image of a b after the transformation is gonna be zero, zero. So apparently a equals to one and b, let's say it's a minus one, okay? Therefore option b is correct if you solved these two equations correctly. All right, question 10. Question 10 is a typical question regarding, you know, um, some different function we don't, we don't often see. 
this f of x is x plus sine x. So let's talk about the each option. The graph of f has a horizontal asymptote. Well, I don't think so because horizontal asymptote needs you to have some sort of behavior like x approaches to infinity, y approaches to a certain number k, etc. But it, apparently it doesn't look like it has one. And um, there are infinitely many solutions to f of x equals to 4. So if you're trying to get a graph of this function x plus sine x, for example, x plus sine x. Well, there's only one intersection, okay? So option B is not true. And the third option says f has a period of two pi. Well, periodicity means, okay, for each x, for any x, if you add a two pi along the graph, you get the same y value. But you can see the graph is gradually increasing, okay? Therefore, we never have, you know, a repeating y value. Needless to say, a complete repeating pattern or repeating cycle. So we can't say the period is two pi, okay? Unless we just talk about a sine x. So option C is incorrect. And then finally, if I look at the derivative of f dash of x, or actually the derivative of f is uh, f dash of x. Say, well, if I plot shift minus x, f1 of x. You can see wherever along the red graph, this is the derivative of x plus sine x. The minimum is um, zero, the maximum is two, okay? So f dash of x is between zero and two, therefore option D is correct. Option E is definitely not correct because it's not a cosine x, okay? So that is question 10. All right, question 11. It's a moderate um, probability question, but uh, it's a bit unfamiliar because we don't often deal with, you know, the letters when we are calculating probabilities. What I'm trying to say is um, we need to understand the meaning of independent event. If A and B are independent event, first idea is you multiply probability A and probability B. You will get a probability of A intersecting B, okay? So let's say um, A and B are independent events when mm, we could actually divide A by both, uh, both sides by A. So this looks like probability of B given A, okay? Therefore, I would say if probability B equals to probability of B given A, then we say this is a um, pair of independent events, okay? Similarly, we may derive something like probability of B given A dash is irrelevant to probability of A dash which retains a constant, okay? Now, if I like to get, a, let's say, some sort of a nice result around this, we need to look at the provided information like a probability A equals to P, probability B given A equals to M, probability of B given A dash equals to N, all right? So you can see, all right, irrespective of whether or not a dash happened or irrespective of uh, irrespective of, of whether or not a happened we need to eventually get the same result which means this thing was m this thing was n m must equal to n okay so option a is correct all right, so let me just reiterate it here. If A and B are independent events, we could say B given A, doesn't matter if A happened or not. We say probability B must equal to probability of B given A, or 
probability of A given B equals to probability of A. And that also applies to their, you know, complementary events for the condition. That is saying if A and B are independent, then A dash and B will be independent of each other. And uh, A dash and A dash will be independent of each other as well as uh, A, B dash, etc. So these are some uh, conceptual understanding around that. Okay, question 12. It's a simple moderate problem. If one to four f of x dx equals to four and two to four f of x dx is minus two, we can actually split, let's say one to two f dx add two to four f dx equals to one to four function f with respect to dx. So what we have here, this is negative two, this is four. And this one to two f dx is, in, is an unknown. So you can treat it like an unknown part. One to two f dx is actually four plus two, which is six. And coming back to the integration we want to calculate, we can split that into two parts. One to two f dx plus one to two x dx. So the first part is six. The second part is half x squared from one to two. So you get a six plus, let's say, um, four divided by two minus a half, okay? So this is actually a definite integration. You sub in the value and take a subtraction. So six plus three over two, and that gives me 15 over two. So option E is correct. All right, question 13. The graph of the function f passes through the point minus two seven. If um, h of x equals to half, f of half x plus five, we need to get another corresponding point after the transformation. Let's say on f of x, we have a point with coordinate minus two to seven. So once we get to f of half x, this can be described by a dilation factor of four, factor of two actually, from the y-axis. If I say dilation is from the y-axis, that means we multiply the dilation factor to the actual x coordinate. So you get a minus four comma seven, okay? Times the x coordinate by two. And then the next graph will be f half x at a five. So this is a translation by five units upwards. So you actually need to add a five to the y coordinate, which will give you minus four comma 12, okay? So option C is the correct answer. A common misunderstanding will be dealing with this, like I'm treating this like a dilation factor half, but uh, this is actually in the function mapping notation. So the dilation factor from y axis is two, okay? So that's question 13. Question 14, the, weight of, the weights of packets of lollies are normally distributed with mean of 200 grams. If 97 of these packets of lollies have a weight of more than 190, the standard deviation is um, you know, evaluated to one decimal place. So what you're gonna do is you draw a diagram for the bell-shaped curve. In the middle, you've got a 200, 97% the area more than, large than 190. So let's say this is 190. I've got this much area equal to 0 0.97, okay? But we don't know my standard deviation. So we can actually use the CAS calculator and calculate whatever we want to find. Let's insert a calculator, and then we use the solve button. After the solve button, we just type norm CDF from 190 to infinity, because the upper bound of the probability is infinity. 
and uh, the mean value is 200. Now, we don't know about, about our standard deviation, so we need to have, let's say, a letter here. But let's treat this as an equation. If we know x value, we will get 0 0.97. But we don't know x value, so we have to solve for x. And um, the CAS calculator won't be able to you know, give you any value if you don't specify a domain restriction for x. So you have to go back, press Enter, and um, because standard deviation has to be positive, you will type x greater than zero and then press Control Enter, which gives you 5.3 grams, correct, to one decimal place. So option B is correct, okay? Now let's come back to question 15 and do some uh, further work. So we say, let f of x be x squared minus 4x plus 2 and f5 equals to 7. The function g is the inverse function of f. So g of x equals to f inverse of x. So we want to find the derivative of a g with respect to x at x equals to 7. So what you can do is first, you need to note, this is the um, you know, right-hand side branch of a parabola. It was restricted to a one-to-one -one function. And then you can find the inverse of this function. So if I were to find the inverse, I'm able to use the CAS calculator. Solve button, x equals to swapping x and y, in this case, x and g. So we say g squared minus 4g plus 2, comma 4g. And you are able to get two parts, a negative square root function or a positive square root function. If you plot both graphs, let's say, if I plot x squared minus 4x plus 2 for x greater than or equal to 2, that will be an increasing function. So the inverse function is supposed to be increasing as well. Now, negative option, if you choose the negative arm of the square root graph, that wouldn't give you an increasing graph. So you can see now, this is the correct selection of the inverse function. It has to be symmetrical to the original graph, okay? So now we are finding the derivative of this guy, which is f4. You may want to split the screen while you can still see the graph here. For example, um, let's do this. Okay, so now we are deriving f4. So we add a calculator on the right-hand side. Put a shift minus x, f of 4, x, given x equals to 7. And that gives you 1 out of 6. This is the derivative of the inverse function at x equals to 7. Okay? So that's what you're trying to find. All right. So that's option A. And we may move on to question 16 onwards. Question 16, part of the graph of y equals to f of x is shown below. It's actually a very simple function, but a slightly unfamiliar because you can see this is a stationary point of inflection on the original graph, but uh, we get so used to x to the power of three, but why don't we try x to the power of five, okay? X to the power of five. So this x equals to zero indicates an x to the power of five. And uh, this is a distinct linear root, let's say, x minus 6, cutting through x minus 6. And you can see there is a clear turning point at x equals to 5. So that actually strengthens the possibility to get an x to the power of 5 as one factor, OK? Now I would like to get an f dash of x graph amongst all these selections. So if you were to find the correct selection, I would say because there is a 0 gradient um, at x equals to 5, say dy dx equals to zero when x equals to five. The only possibilities will be, you know, that, that, and that. And overall, this is a positive, you know, positive polynomial graph, I suppose. The highest power is five plus one, that's six. So we call this is a hexic, hexic graph, degree six. 
Once you take the derivative, you get, let's say, a quintic. That's power five, okay? And a positive hex gives you a positive polynomial quintic. So option B is not suitable because it's, it has an overall decreasing trend. And uh, option D is not suitable because it seems um, to be a cubic. So therefore the only possibility I would say is option A, okay? And we can actually use the cast to verify. For example, if you go back to your cast calculator and then add a graph, you could actually say x to the power of five times x minus six. So you can see there is a, you know, a very deep, very deep turning point, far below minus 6.67, et cetera. So I probably would get a minus 200, mm, still not enough. So maybe minus 2000, still not enough. Let's try minus 5000, better. Let's try 5000 here. Yep, looks better. And um, if I want the derivative graph of what we just created, because the power is very large, we have to use very large y values. And uh, we take the derivative f5 of x. See, that confirms our choices or guesses were very, very successful because now you can see there is a turning point minimum along this green graph, five minus 3,125. And along the orange graph, which is a derivative graph, here is a zero at a five comma zero, okay? Here is an x intercept along the derivative graph. So this is what I'm trying to say, okay? All right, let's keep going with the other questions. Question 17. A box contains M marbles that are identical in every way except for color of which K marbles are colored red and the remainder of the marbles are colored green. So I suggest if you have a two different colors, like the four color pen, well, K marbles are colored red. And let's say the rest is N minus K will be colored green. Two marbles are drawn randomly from the box. If the first marble is not replaced into the box, then the probability that the two marbles drawn are the same color. Well, if we try the tree diagram, we could have red to red or red to green. Green to red, green to green. But be mindful, the selection process is without replacement. So each time we take one thing out, the total number must be one less. Therefore, once you get, you know, the red color, red color marble from the first selection, the total number of red will be K minus one. If you take a green marble from the box first, then you will have M minus K minus one in the green selection, okay? on the next green selection. And this time we are not just counting how many ways it could be uh, combined. I'm calculating the probability. So for the first uh, two branches, I will need to divide each, each number by N, by the total number N, okay? By the total number N. And for the second selection, because the total number has been decreased by one, one taken now, you need to multiply um, you know, or divide by, divide everything by N minus one. And this is M minus one, okay? So pretty much this tree diagram will provide you K over N times K minus one over N minus one plus N minus K divided by N times N minus K minus one divided by N minus one. So all together, you're supposed to get this nice fraction. which indicates option D, okay? 
Of course, option E is not suitable. It looks like we are using n choose two times p squared y minus p n minus two. Well, this is without replacement, not with replacement. If it was a sampling with replacement, then using the binomial probability expression will be suitable, okay? So that's question 17. Question 18. Um, from my experience, I would say, I thought this question was the hardest amongst the 20 multi-choice question in 2019, because um, the dis distribution of a continuous random variable X is defined by the probability density function P of X. The P of X goes from minus A to B, but it has two parts. One part is like a straight line, and the other part is like another negative gradient straight line. Um, it is known that the average value of P over the interval minus A to B is three over four. And um, we actually need to figure out, you know, two conditions, two constant A and B. So what I'm trying to do here with you, well, first of all, you need to figure out the total area and equate to one because it's a probability density function. Effective area equals to one. So let's say this is a triangle A1. A1 is half times 2A times A. I'm talking about the physical distance, okay? So that would be A squared. A2 is a trapezium which is half times, let's say, um, upper base is B here, lower base is 2A. And uh, this is the height, B, multiplied by B, okay? So eventually, when you add these two quantity up, you will have A squared plus B over two times B plus 2A, equals to, let's say, one, that's the total area. And also another important idea is average value. What does average value mean? Average height. So we could say, sign the area divided by interval length. So what is my interval length? The interval length is from x equals to b to x equals to minus a, where we already figured out this area expression. So we could say a squared plus half b times b plus 2a divided by, this whole thing is divided by b plus a equals to 3 over 4, okay? And we now have a pair of the simultaneous equations which is very suitable for us to use the CAS calculator, provided that A, B are positive real numbers. So all we need to do is now enter these two equations into our CAS calculator, and then we can find A, B values. Now, the last thing is probability X greater than zero. Once we figure out the A and B values, you will need to figure out the area of A2 because that's the effective area for X greater than zero, okay? So we need to chuck in the AB value into which one? Into the trapezium area, which is A2, okay? And again, half times B times B plus two A equals to something, okay? So that is the flow chart of this problem. So let's get to some calculator stuff. Firstly, we need a solve button. A curly bracket. 
Let's type out everything carefully. A squared plus B over two times B plus two A equals to one comma. And also A squared plus B over two times bracket B plus two A divided by B plus A equals to, let's say three quarters comma A comma B. Go outside the curly bracket. The curly bracket includes a list of two simultaneous equations. Outside the curly bracket comma indicating your variables. And then put a given that there, A greater than zero space and B greater than zero. So now you will get a pair of a uh, solution. A is root two over three, B is minus root two minus four over three. And the trapezium area is this guy here. So we can just copy this down or copy this down and a slot in a given that. Copy that. Which is seven over nine, option D. So this involved at least a three steps. Forming one equation from the probability density function um, condition, area equals to one. And also using the area divided by a plus b equals to uh, three over four. Actually, you could simplify the problem because you know this is one, okay? This is an alternative way to solve the problem. If you were pref uh, preferring um, a by hand approach, but uh, you got a, a cast calculator anyway. So let's come back to the last two multi-choice questions. Okay, question 19. Given that tangent alpha equals to D, D is greater than zero and alpha is between zero and a half pi, which is an acute angle, okay? Acute angle. The sum of the solutions to tangent two X equal to D where Z X goes from zero to five pi over four. So the working domain is gonna be zero less than two X less than five pi over two, okay? What does that mean? If you're thinking about the graph here, well, you could slot in, let's say, um, this is a pi over four, pi over two, three pi over four, this is pi, and um, this is five pi over four. And the graph of tangent two x is, is dilated by a factor of half, okay, from the y-axis. So this will be something you obtain in terms of the graph. Now sketch them. You could actually get, for example, three curves here. And um, if tangent two X equals to D, let's just draw a horizontal line here. Okay. Um, now, this is Y equals to D. And the first solution here, what is that? I suppose, because you can establish some relevance, tangent alpha equals to tangent two X equals to D. So you can say two X equals to alpha and X equals to half alpha, okay? So this first solution is X equals to half alpha. And then from one solution to next solution, next intersection, you add a period. And what is your period? Period for tangent two X is pi over two rather than pi because it has been dilated by half. So the second solution will give you half alpha plus half pi. And the last solution here will be x equals to half alpha plus pi, okay? So when you add them up, you will get sum is three lots of alpha divided by two plus three lots of pi divided by two, which is option E, okay? So that is a graphical approach. Of course, you could try some special value. Let's say you try D equals to y. And then your alpha must be pi over four. And then you can test each option consecutively. Eventually, option E will match your selection.
And lastly, question 20. Question 20. Mm. <coughs> Bear with me. I would say this is a very straightforward change of base function. So reciprocal property. For any log A, B, it's equal to one over log B of A. That's the only thing you need to know. So log X, Y is actually one over log Y, X plus one over log Z of Y. So option D will be correct, okay? X, Y, Z are all real numbers greater than one. So that's pretty much uh, the end of the story, but I, I have one thing to say. Change of base formula can be used to prove the reciprocal property. So for example, log x, y equals to natural log of y or log 10 y divided by natural log of x. And you can recognize this is one over natural log of x, natural log of y. Previously, look, if the base is x, argument is y, it can be split as a ratio of natural log, your old argument divided by natural log or your old base, okay? But um, this is true because we can take the reciprocal, one divided by reciprocal, and then we can use the change of base formula again. So now this x in the denominator becomes your new argument. This y here will become your new base, okay? So this is actually using the change of base to operate on each logarithmic expression, all right? All right, this is my video going through the 20 multi-choice question. There will be a separate video going through the extended response question. 